would you rather be? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. Welcome to the Alumni Association's People of Penn State podcast. Each week on the podcast, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about, and you can expect to hear the voice, uh, you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State network. You can find the People of Penn State podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcast app of choice. Subscribe and give us a rating. Ratings and reviews help others find these great stories, and it's the best way to connect Penn Staters to the great stories that we're sharing here on the People of Penn State podcast. We have another great story lined up for you on today's show. Today, I'm joined by Ryan Brown. He's a former student leader, retired Navy lieutenant, currently working in Johnson & Johnson's Military Veteran Leadership Development Program. He's a current MBA student in the Smeal College of Business. He's an alumni council member. He's an entrepreneur. We're going to get to all of that coming up here in just a minute, but let's welcome Ryan into the People of Penn State podcast. Ryan, how are you? I'm doing well, Paul. How are you? Good. if If we could have a subtitle for this podcast, it would be, it would be staying busy. (laughs) <laughs> because uh, I think that we're going to start to see that trend here in just a couple minutes. But before we get into all of that, share a little bit about your journey to Penn State. How did you become a Nittany Lion? Um, so that all started with an individual by the name of Kurt Marshall. Uh, so Kurt Marshall uh, invited me up to Penn State for the Spend a Fall Day event uh, as I was uh, pursuing a, uh, a degree in architecture at the time. And uh, once I came up to Penn State, it, you know, it was just kind of history, just seeing Penn State in the fall, uh, being able to sort of experience that football atmosphere. It was it was absolutely incredible. And I was like, you know what, this is this is definitely the place for me. It has the program that I want. Um, and the people here actually you know, care about me as a person. So um, that sort of uh, lend myself to to me, you know, putting my all into getting into Penn State. You are not the first person that I've heard that that Kurt Marshall was the guy who opened the door to Penn State. Uh, he's done that for so many. Uh, you mentioned an interest in architecture. Where did that um, Where did that kind of um, grow from? Um, I started in high school, right? Uh, I attended a small high school in the city of Philadelphia uh, by the name of the Charter High School for Architecture and Design. Um, and basically they were just exposing, you know, inner city youth to more of the arts and design, um, community. And, you know, I got to spend a lot of time working with architects, uh, in my early years. So around like, uh, 10th and 11th, 10th, 11th and 12th grade, I actually was an intern at a, um, local architecture firm, um, out in, out in Philadelphia, uh, Ewing Cole where I was able to work with the team on a number of projects uh, throughout my time uh, to include the, uh, the the MetLife Stadium that the Giants and Jets play in. Um, and that sort of helped, um, you know, stoke the fire that was, you know, my desire to become an architect. That's uh, since changed, though. That's <laughs> amazing. That's, that's, a, that's a great project to be a part of. We were just yeah. talking about that the other day. Like, how insulting is it? that the Jets have to play in Giant Stadium. Like they don't even have their own, they don't even have their own stadium as a, a pro franchise. I think that changed with, <laughs> with the new stadium, but maybe yeah. that's part of the curse of the New York Jets. Probably so. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we I talked, I alluded to this early earlier, but you were, um, while at Penn State, you were involved in Black Caucus. You were in UPUA. You uh, were a leader with the uh, National Pan-Hellenic Council a member of Alpha Phi Alpha. Talk a little bit about these, about these student experiences and how did you 
manage to pack all of those into your time here at Penn State? Um, yeah, so I, I got involved really, really quickly at Penn State. Um, actually, during my first semester at Penn State, um, I joined Black Caucus. And I, I joined Black Caucus because I was looking for a way to be able to build community at Penn State, and, and Black Caucus offered me that opportunity. Uh, shortly after that, I, I joined my fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha, um, and, you know, the everything else just sort of followed and just built upon the experiences I had along along my journey throughout Penn State. Um, you know, you, you mentioned a, a few things that I was a part of, but, you know, I, I, I found myself, you know, becoming more and more of a voice for the people of color at Penn State, um, you know, specifically the students of color uh, to sort of help elevate their voices to the highest levels possible uh, during my time at Penn State uh, to sort of help uh, combat different things that they experience along their journey. Um, and that the, the, the catalyst for that was really my own personal experience at Penn State. Um, I dealt with uh, some, some racism and some uh, sort, of, sort of discriminatory acts in my early years at Penn State. And it sort of helped being a part of um, Black Caucus um, sort of helped me be able to sort of channel uh, that negative experience into something positive um, to be able to ensure that future students don't uh, have to deal with some of the hardships that I dealt with along my journey. Um, and so um, everything just sort of built on top of each other. I went from just being a general member of Black Caucus to being on the executive board and, and staying on the executive board until I graduated, uh, served, you know, in a number of capacities within my fraternity um, and while undergraduate as well as, you know, in, in my alumni status. Um, was a member of UPUA strictly out of ensuring that there was a, a voice uh, for the students of color at Penn State because I found that UPUA often overlooked uh, the needs of uh, black and brown students at Penn State. Um, you know, I, I served on the MLK committee, I was on MPHC, I did a, a number of things uh, so include, you know, different societies and, and stuff like that uh, while, while, at, while at Penn State. Um, and, you know, it was it was really rewarding to be able to sort of help elevate the voices of the students. You know, I, I had pretty much a direct line to the university president um, at the time, Rodney Erickson, um, to sort of help elevate any issues and, 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 and really bring to light, you know, the, the experience of the students of color at Penn State. Um, and just facilitating anything that needed to be done along that journey. You know, we have featured uh, Fatima Odebesi on this uh, program, on a previous version of this program when it was called Coffee Hour. Uh, mm -hmm. And she talked about her work as Black Caucus president and um, ensuring that um, the communities of color were represented on UPUA. But you actually um, were a predecessor to that effort in ensuring that Black Caucus actually had a seat on UPUA. Talk a little bit about, about that journey and how you've now seen that evolve. Absolutely. Um, so uh, to, to provide a little background on that, um, Black Caucus is the umbrella organization for, for the multicultural student organizations at Penn State University, um, specifically uh, main campus or, or university park. Um, and so we have a contingency of, of students that come to us and voice their concerns. Um, so essentially, you know, for, for lack of better words, uh, Black Caucus is like the student government for, right. um, for multicultural organizations at Penn State. You know, we help, we help elevate their voice. We help encourage their programming. We help do a number of things to, to sort of bring light to all the different things that they have going on but we're also the the force that fights for whatever they need and so during my time i instead of just going to upua and being like hey black caucus specifically needs a seat i decided to run and so while serving as president of black caucus i ran for upua and won an at-large seat um, and was able to serve as a representative to sort of help uh, elevate the voice of the students of color um, because UPUA historically 
uh, really only represented, you know, uh, a, a non a non person of color uh, contingency at Penn State, um, just just based off of who was involved and and the different uh, leadership that they had at the time. Um, and so after after I ran and I, I started up a lot of <laughs> I started up a lot of trouble for UPUA. Um, you know, staging walk-ins, staging sit-ins, uh, bringing every student of color I could possibly think of to the to the meetings to help uh, fill out the open forum so that they actually hear directly from the students the things that are bothering them, whether it was, uh, you know, lack of funding opportunities, whether it was um, a, a lack of a support uh, from the university or, 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 you know, something more specific, like some race related issue, sure. I, I made sure that these students had the opportunity to be heard, uh, no matter what. And so I gave, I gave the community, um, a, a direct line into UPUA essentially. And from there, you know, all of the students that sort of followed, um, my time at Penn state built upon that by, instead of you know forcing someone to to run um, for a UPUA seat every single year, uh, they fought to have a seat actually um, delegated for the Black Caucus right um, organization and have that that black and brown voice um, be able to be highlighted uh, without having to sort of fight for a seat the same way that IFC and Penn Hell have their seats on on UPUA. Right. right. Sounds like uh, what John Lewis might call some good trouble uh, <laughs> that, you were, that you were stirring up while you were here at Penn State. Absolutely. They didn't see it that way at the time, but that's <laughs> definitely what it was. This is the People of Penn State podcast. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by Ryan Brown. Ryan is the CEO of We Are Wonderfully Made. We're going to talk a little bit about that. In COO. The COO. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Did I steal your wife's title? You stole my wife's title. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Apologies. Uh, hopefully, you won't. Hopefully, I won't get in any trouble. I'll, I'll take thing. all the heat for that one. <laughs> the CEO of COO of We Are Wonderfully Made, Ryan. Before we get into talking about that, um, after Penn State, um, you went into service to our country through the United States Navy. Talk a little bit about that decision and when you knew military service was going to be. Um, something that you would pursue. Absolutely. Um, you know, this ties into sort of the, the earlier anecdote that I provided about, you know, my experiencing some racism and discrimination at Penn State. So we talked about a little bit of how I had desires to become an architect. Um, early in my Penn State career, uh, that was sort of derailed by um, by a professor and some of his actions uh, that sort of led me to leave uh, the architecture program. Um, and from there, I was kind of um, displaced in terms of uh, uh, employment opportunities because of the degree that I, I went with, I went with uh, strictly from a more strategic standpoint of being able to keep my credits uh, that I had already accumulated through the architecture program uh, and still be able to graduate within four years because that's when my scholarship was going to run up. Um, and so I graduated in May of 2013 with a degree in integrative arts. Um, and, you know, I still tried to pursue architecture, um, but because I didn't have a, like a bachelor's of science in architecture or, um, or, or a bachelor's of architecture, um, I really couldn't enter the architectural world. And so I was was not really offered um, a, a job opportunity um, following college. I applied to a number of firms to be like a drafter or, you know, just kind of work my way up into the ranks. Um, and it, it it didn't yield anything for me. And so I, I received a couple of offers was like, hey, you can you can come in work with us but it will be more in terms of like an internship opportunity so you wouldn't be paid um and so with no opportunities to actually make money i knew i knew that you know i had told myself a very long time ago um if if i 
had the opportunity to serve in the military, um, I would do so. I, you know, I told myself that um, way back in high school um, when I was trying to figure out a way to make sure that I was able to exit the environment I grew up. Um, and so it was either go to college or join the military. And I had the opportunity now to do both, go to college and join the military. And um, I walked into a recruiter office uh, probably three or four months before my May graduation date and was like, look, I'm getting ready to graduate here. I'd like to join. And the rest has been history. You know, I was able to complete my time um, in, birth, in both the submarine community as well as the surface warfare community. Um, and I had a very successful career. Oh, Paul, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, throughout your military experience, you had a variety. Uh, throughout your military career, you had a variety of experiences. How did these shape where you wanted to take your career following your service? Um, the military taught me that I had value, regardless of what my degree said and what fields I wasn't able to enter um, out of uh, undergrad. The military taught me some valuable lessons that made sure that I was marketable in any sort of job market, uh, just based off of my military experience and, and being a people leader throughout my time in the military. Um, you know, it taught me taught me a lot about perseverance and sort of overcoming and, and just sort of being able to to make the best out of whatever situation you're placed in. Um, you become you become a, a, a MacGyver type you know, coming out of the military. And so you're able to, you know, um, I guess, adapt to any environment that you're placed in. And so that that led me to where I am today. So I mentioned in the introduction that you are uh, part of Johnson & Johnson's Military Veteran Leadership Development Program. Share a little bit about that program, how you got involved in that and what's entailed. Absolutely. Um, so I, uh, upon knowing that I was going to be um, retired out of the military back in um, June of this year, um, probably around January, I started searching for uh, job opportunities and I was contacted by, uh, by a headhunting company, uh, or recruiting company, uh, basically in, you know, outlining what this program was and so the military veterans leadership development program here at johnson and johnson seeks to hire uh junior officers um out of the military to, to sort of help uh cultivate uh, sort of innovation and and uh, uh different way of thinking within the med, med tech and uh, uh, community um and so essentially this program offers you um full-time employment with uh, Johnson & Johnson, um, where you're able to sort of experience different aspects of the corporate world um, through three different rotations. Uh, each rotation is six months. And so right now I'm in my first rotation um, where I'm working on developing a virtual reality strategy for, uh, for Johnson & Johnson's Ethicon brand, um, which is uh, focused around uh, medical devices. Um, and so this rotational period allows you to kind of sort of test the waters um, with different areas of, of corporate America that you um, find of interest or you think you'll be uh, sort of valuable at. And you're able to sort of leverage your military experience while learning about uh, sort of the, the, the company culture, the, um, the way corporate America works. Um, and be able to translate your military skills into something that, that is going to be of value to the company in the future. That's exciting. The, the Penn State network, the power of the Penn State network is really strong at J&J. Um, I'm sure you're running into Penn Staters all the time. I know Wanda Hope is doing some great work over there um, mm -hmm. for Johnson & Johnson. So, yeah, you have to feel the power of the Penn State network over Absolutely. there. Absolutely. So, all right, so you're you've just come out of the military. Yes. You're working at Johnson and Johnson. You're a current grad student at Penn State in as a, as a world campus student, um, and 
you're an entrepreneur. And I'm sure I'm forgetting a bunch of other things like service to alumni council in there. Let's, let's, let's dive into your entrepreneurial journey. How, um, how starting We Are Wonderfully Made came about. And let's let folks know a little bit about your company. Absolutely. So um, We Are Wonderfully Made came about just through, um, you know, my wife's desire to to own her own business. And so for years, she's been trying different things um, and she just never really had a passion for it. And then one day her grandmother sat her down and taught her the family recipe for for hot sauce. Um, And so my wife, who is of Trinidadian descent, her Trinidadian grandmother taught her um, how to make Trinidadian pepper sauce. Uh, and you know, her, my wife's father was basically like, Hey, Iman, you should, you should, you know, make this your company. You should bring this to market. And after some thinking, she was like, you know, I don't really like any other hot sauce and this is really great. So I imagine people will enjoy it too. But also when looking at the hot sauce market, there's not, um, there's not really a representation for Trinidad and Tobago and in, in the hot sauce market. When they think of Caribbean sauces, everyone know automatically jumps to Jamaica. Right. Um, but doing this allows uh, Trinidad to sort of get its, its day in, in the spotlight. And so, you know, she had the family connection. She had the 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 passion to keep this going. Um, and she came to me one day. Well, she sent me an email because I was deployed when she initially started uh, this idea. Um, she emailed me while I'm in the Middle East and was like, hey, I want to start this company. You know, are you willing to help me? And my wife, knowing that I am, as she says, an extrovert and all I do is network and all this stuff. Um, she was like, you know, I, I could really use a partner that's able to talk to people. Um, I was like, sure, no problem. And she kind of gave me the rundown. I was like, yeah, you know, this is this is absolutely great. So um, fast forward a few months, I'm back home from deployment. We start making the sauce in our house um, and start selling it, um, you know, while we were stationed in Virginia. And, um, you know, it's a big hit. And we're like, OK, you know, we have to we have to continue this. And this was back in 2018. Um, and you know, we just continued on this journey, built out a website, you know, started started manufacturing um, through um, um, a manufacturing facility, uh, working with different distributors and are in the process of just kind of continuing to grow the company um, as, as far and wide as we can, selling authentic Trinidadian pepper sauce. And so right now we have two flavors. We have our original Trini, which uh, is grandma's tried and true recipe. Um, and then we have the uh, mango, which is one of our uh, spins on on the actual original recipe uh, to uh, really kind of bring out the lo- a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of additional flavor, uh, and sort of highlight some other uh, Caribbean or tropical flavors along the journey. There you go. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can see uh, some of the uh, some of the product that that Ryan's talking about, right? You know, what what was what was the journey to kind of learn this new business like, right? I I'm imagining that there are some um, like FDA regulations. I'm imagining that there's like how do you how do you source like bottling and um, and and kind of the the marketing and brand. Uh, things that you need to have in place to be competitive, really in a in a crowded marketplace, right? You walk yeah. into any um, any specialty store and go to the the hot sauce section, right? And it's and it's really crowded, right? So talk a little bit about kind of the the learning process that you went through to bring this to market. Um, so we were we were very uh, fortunate in that. Um, when entering into this uh, sort of market, there's not really a lot of uh, true barriers to to uh, to entry. And so 
we we focused initially on just being direct to consumer. That way we didn't have to worry about um, really any any limitations that might be placed on us by these big companies requiring us to have a certain amount of inventory and requiring to sell through by a certain time frame. Um, and we just started really grassroots. Um, we we spent a whole lot of time uh, kind of dealing with uh, the city and, and states uh, regulations along our journey. Like I mentioned, we started making it in our kitchen. Um, and so there are certain cottage laws that you're that you are required to follow. And it it also limits how much money you can make. So once you make a certain amount, depending on the state you're in, you can't you can't actually uh, manufacture and, and, and sell any more of your products. So. Um, you're required to start, you know, sort of stepping up your your manufacturing, which comes with additional regulations. And like you mentioned, there there are some uh, some uh, further FDA regulations that are required, especially when you start uh, shipping products nationwide through various climates and environments. Um, and so we're able to we're able to manage that by uh, finding us a, a manufacturing facility that has all the FDA. Uh, regulations and guidelines, and they're able to properly source all of our material um, and uh, get our, get our bottles and and you know work with us to to put our labels on them and all that stuff. So um, it was a lot of it was a lot of work, and actually the my Penn State network is is what helped us find the manufacturing company um, that that is actually bottling our sauce for us. So uh, you know. A huge thank you to the food science uh, majors uh, that I reached out to um, that were able to sort of help direct me uh, on, on that journey uh, to sort of be able to be able to manufacture uh, and distribute nationwide. So if I am um, if I'm going to have like a traditional Trinidadian meal, maybe some gear of pork uh, and, and I need to get my I need to get my sauce, where can I find um, and go out and buy your Trini sauce. So you can go to our website, wewonderfullymade.com. Um, you can also go to amazon.com and search We Are Wonderfully Made, and our sauces will come up. You'll see our, our, our lovely clear label and our uh, different varieties of, of sauces that are available there. That's amazing. So if you are looking to try out a new hot sauce, go to their website follow them on instagram check yeah. them out on facebook w a wonderfully made or we are wonderfully uh you can uh go ahead and, and get yourself some uh some of this great hot sauce from a fellow penn stater yeah ryan i, I want to talk a little bit about um your service to penn state absolutely right you were you were a student leader um, you've went off and, and were in your military service, uh, even during your military service, you were, um, you were active in the, the San Diego chapter when you were, when you were out there. Um, and now you're a member of alumni council. I'd imagine your reason for getting with alumni council is similar to your reason for getting involved as a student with black caucus and UPUA. But talk a little bit about how you continue to advance the, um, the the voice of people of color, of fellow Penn Staters of color. Absolutely, I I think I think there is a lot to um, sort of digest there. <laughs> We're talking about uh, all the all the reasons why you know I continue to be of service to Penn State. You know, um, it's. I, I do it out of a love for the people that I've met um, who who don't want to talk about what they experienced at Penn State. Um, I, and, and being the person that I am, um, I think it's important for Penn State to be able to understand the narrative of all of its students. Um, specifically the students of color because you know more often than not it's the students of color that graduate from penn state and never come back never never re-engage 
um, because they had some negative experience uh, while at Penn State or just overall didn't have a good time. You know, when you see when you see the the droves of people coming back to Penn State, it's, it's usually it's usually uh, those in the majority population. Um, and as far as they're concerned, Penn State was great, and there was there's nothing bad that can be said about it. But there's an there's definitely an alternative narrative that 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 goes on at Penn State that a lot of people don't get to see. And if through my service to the university um, and to its alumni population and student population, I can highlight the the different narratives that go on at Penn State, I'll continue to do that. Um, it's 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 just one of those things where you want people to see the whole story. And it's not to diminish um, the the legacy that is Penn State because you know Penn State did help shape and mold me, good experiences, wow. and bad experiences. Um, but it's it's to provide a full picture. Um, to show that, you know, while Penn State is a great place, it can still be better. And it can be better by acknowledging the hardships that students of color face on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's, it's acknowledging the hardships that the alumni have faced throughout right. their time at Penn State and help sort of mend those, um, those, those things so that people can come back to Penn State uh, with an open heart and open mind uh, to be able to to impact the next generation of Penn Staters as we move forward. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's those voices uh, being represented, those voices being heard, um, things changing because those voices are at the table mm -hmm. is what makes all of us uh, stronger, right? It makes it makes Penn State a better place um, because of that. Uh, we're, we're, we're not able to grow if we're if we're ignoring populations right and so that's Absolutely. why we are particularly thrilled uh, to have you on alumni council as well as um several of of your fellow pens i say several 108 fellow members <laughs> of alumni council all representing uh, a voice there uh, of penn staters that that they're there to represent absolutely this, this is the people of penn state podcast i'm paul clifford i'm joined by Ryan Brown, he's the COO of We Are Wonderfully Made. Ryan, we like to have a little bit of fun here on the podcast with some quick hitter questions here at the end. So I'm going to throw a couple of questions at you and just let's see what's the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Right, what is your favorite hot sauce? Like your go-to? The Trini sauce. The Trini sauce. All right. Yes. How about your favorite class at Penn State? My favorite class at Penn State was uh, all of the African and African-American studies courses I took. Um, yeah, they were absolutely amazing. If you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? And I'm going to I'm also going to add a little bit of, of a twist to this. Um, where would it be and what would you be? What would you be eating? Um, <laughs> wow. Um, wow. I'd probably say I'd want to have dinner with John Lewis. Okay. Um, he he was an icon in the civil rights movement, and everyone always talks about uh, Martin Luther King and and Malcolm X and all the, all the the big name people. But there's something to be said about the people that work and and sort of with limited recognition. Um, and and their their contribution to to the movement and so without without the work he did um through uh, the number of organizations that he was a part of during his youth you know i i wouldn't be able to be in the seats that i am in today uh, what would we eat um that is a tough question um i'd probably I don't know if he'll like this, but I'd probably go with something, something from either, you know, more traditional Southern cooking or maybe something from one of the Caribbean islands, maybe some curry chicken or, or jerk chicken or something like that. Maybe some uh, 
maybe something along the lines of like Thanksgiving dinner. You know, that's all always, right. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. John John Lewis definitely an icon. Tried to influence the system from the outside during the civil rights movement. Uh, certainly influenced the system from the inside as a as a senator uh, yeah. through his political career. What is your most unusual we are moment? You've had the opportunity to travel the world in service to our country. Where was that place where you heard we are or said we are that maybe you weren't expecting it? Um, wow. I was actually um, on, a, on a Liberty port. Um, and where was I? I was in uh, uh, New Amsterdam. Okay. Um, oh, is it? I'm sorry, Amsterdam. Uh, sorry, um, and we were we were walking through the streets. We had just left like the Anne Frank House. Okay. And I, uh, you know, being being the proud Penn Stater I am, I had on like a Penn State sweater, and across like there's like this canal that runs uh, through like the the little main area, and across the canal, I hear this guy yelling we are and i'm like looking around like where are they it's like i haven't heard that in a while where are they and i just yell uh, penn state back and you know he does the whole thing you your welcome thing it was great and everyone from my ship is looking at me like what is happening here and i was like oh it's just a penn state thing don't worry about it it was it was absolutely amazing it was like me with uh with a crowd of like 10 naval officers and everyone's like what is what is he doing <laughs> Yeah, for people who don't know, it's it's hard to explain to them, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, your favorite Penn State sport? Definitely football. Definitely football. All right. And how about your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream? <sighs> okay, so I have to admit uh, that I am probably the most boring ice cream uh, eater in the world. Uh, and so it's either going to be vanilla or like butter pecan. Okay. Okay. Do you know vanilla is the most popular flavor of creamery ice cream? It's the most sold really? flavor of creamery ice nice. cream. Nice. Nice. Yeah, so you are yeah, not right. alone, Ryan. So, <laughs> I Ryan, am not the you. adventurer. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Ryan, thank you so much for um, joining us on the People of Penn State podcast and allowing us to share your story with fellow Penn Staters. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. We also want to thank our listeners. If you like this episode, I hope you will subscribe to the people of Penn State in your favorite podcast app of choice. And while you're there, give us a rating or drop us a review. Help us spread the word. You know, share the podcast with your friends and with fellow Penn Staters via your social media channels and tag the Penn State Alumni Association with at Penn State alums. If you're a member of the Alumni Association, Thank you so much for your support. If you're not a member, what are you waiting for? Visit our website at alumni.psu.edu today, and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thanks for listening, and thank you for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are... When we stood at childhood's gate, shapeless in the hands of fate, thou didst mold us, dear old state, dear old state, dear old state. May no act of ours bring shame to our heart that love thy name. May our lives but swell Dear.